So today, this week, we're going to be finishing off Joshua chapter 8. But while you um, go there, uh, Joshua chapter 8, um, I've titled today's message, Recommitment and Renewal. Before taking Jericho and Ai, chapter 4 told us that Israel had paused at Gilgal to memorialize its crossing. And then in chapter 5, to observe various rituals of purification. Now, after these victories at Jericho and Ai, and as well as a defeat, and before further encounters with the Canaanites, Israel again paused. It paused to confess, to confess and to celebrate with sacrifices and covenant renewal at a different place. This, town, this time at Mount Ebal. After the sin of Achan and the defeat of Ai, the nation again needed a ceremonial reminder of its relationship with God. First, the cause of sin and the defeat was removed, and then victory was secured, which is what we covered last week. But before proceeding further, sacrifices and a renewal of the nation's covenant obligations were in order. As we go through these verses here at the end of chapter 8, we're going to be seeing a recommitment by the nation of Israel a renewal of God's word, the commitment to God's word. As I just had said in this intro, they had already gone through so much. They've tasted victory. They've tasted defeat. But they had to put everything on hold again to recommit themselves to God's word. What Moses had written down in the law. So before we begin reading God's word and get more into details about what's going on here, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to all of us here and those of us watching this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful um, that you have every single person here, Lord, and that you have every single person uh, watching this video. I pray that you will bless everyone here, everyone there, Lord. I pray you will also bless those that will be watching this video or hearing this message uh, later on. Lord, I pray that your, your work, your purpose, your will be done through this message. Lord, I pray that it will speak powerfully about uh, recommitment, renewal, the importance of your word or in how just amazing your grace and mercy is. So now I ask you to, to remove all obstacles, remove anything that is hindering our hearts, our minds from just being at peace right now, from sitting at your feet and hearing Your word. We need you this morning, Lord. I want to hear from you. Keep us safe here, Lord. Fill us, fill this room with your spirit and move powerfully now. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 8, verse 30. The word of God says, At that time, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal to the Lord, the God of Israel. Just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded the Israelites, he built it according to what was written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool was to be used. And they offered burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings on it. There, 
on the stones, Joshua copied the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the Israelites. All Israel, resident alien and citizen alike, with their elders, officers, and judges, stood on either side of the Ark of the Lord, Lord's Covenant, facing the Levitical priest who carried it. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the Lord's servant, had commanded earlier concerning blessing the people of Israel. And I'll stop there. At some point following the victory at Ai, Joshua led the people 30 miles north into Shechem, which lies in the valley of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Now, any military strategists would have looked at this detour as just a foolish waste of time. What's Joshua doing? He's, he's going a totally sip, separate direction. What are we doing? Why is he sending everyone there at, between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim? Ger, Ger, Gerizim. Gerizim, I'm sorry. Now, it would have made more sense to continue on after the victory of Ai and secure the central sector of the land with further victories. Joshua had something more important to take care of. See, he couldn't just ignore some specific instructions that his former mentor, his father figure, his former leader had said and that were boldly imprinted in his memory. Joshua and the entire nation had to obey what Moses had commanded them to do in his farewell speech back in Deuteronomy chapter 27. And just to give an idea, here's what Moses said in that chapter in verses 1 through 8. He gave them these instructions. When you cross the Jordan into the land the Lord your God has given you, Set up large stones and cover them with plaster. Write all the words of the law and the stones after you cross uh, to enter the land the Lord your God has given you, a land flowing with milk and honey. As the Lord, the God of your, ancest the God of your ancestors, has promised you, when you have crossed the Jordan, you are to set up these stones on Mount Ebal, as I am commanding you today, and you are to cover them with plaster. Build an altar of stones there to the Lord your God. Do not use any iron tool on them. Use uncut stones to build the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings to the Lord your God on it. There you are to sacrifice fellowship offerings to eat and rejoice in the presence of the Lord your God. Write clearly all the words of this law on the plastered stones. So you see, although it may have looked strange and foolish to others for Joshua to take this detour, Joshua knew exactly what he was doing when he interrupted the military activities. You see, he wanted to give Israel the opportunity to renew their covenant vows to the Lord as expressed in his law. So upon arriving there at Mount Ebal, as instructed, verse 30 says that Joshua built an altar. Now, Mount Ebal wasn't some just obscure place that Moses randomly picked out. No, not at all. Mo Mount Ebal had historical significance. Back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Abraham had built an altar at Shechem 
And we're also told in Genesis chapter 33 and 34 that Jacob had built an altar there as well. And he even actually lived there for a while. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 29, Moses instructed that Mount Ebal was to be a site of curses. Now, I'll get more into that in just a bit, what that means, but this is also significant. You know why? Because Galatians, yes, New Testament Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, says that only a sacrifice of blood can save sinners from the curse of the law. As I said, I'll touch more on that when I get to verse 33. But in building the altar, Joshua was very, very careful to obey what it said in Exodus chapter 20. The, the diagrams, the rules, what that, again, that altar was to look like. He was careful to obey it and not apply any tool to the stones picked up there in the field. Now why, you may be asking, why couldn't he use any iron tools on this altar? Well, the purpose for God asking the altar to be built this way is simple. He did it that way. He, he asked for a simple stone altar rather than one designed and decorated by human hands. He did that to prevent human works to be associated with the sacrifice. Why is that? Simple, simple easy. Because it's not the beauty of man-made religion that gives the sinner forgiveness, but the blood on the altar. After the altar had been built, the last part of verse 31 mentioned that the ceremony now, that ceremony they were about to conduct included two different types of sacrifices, burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. If you don't know what the difference is, um, it's explained in, there in the book of Leviticus. The details are there, but I'll try to briefly cover the two. Burnt offerings were sacrifices that were entirely, that entirely consumed the animal or animals. And they were offered as an aroma pleasing to the Lord to atone for the sacrificer's sins. Now, the fact that these offerings were made indicates that one function of the activities at Mount Ebal was to atone for the nation's sins. Fellowship offerings. What are fellowship offerings? Well, they were an expression of gratitude to God for His goodness and it involved a portion of the meat given to the priest and another portion to the ones presenting it. And so as the name suggests, the main idea behind this offering was fellowship. Was fellowship with God and with one another, with family. They'd take a portion of this meat and just have a cookout. So the fact that these were offered indicates they were seeking to reestablish a sense of relationship and well-being with God. Felt like something was missing. That fellowship, even though they had, God had forgiven them and they had, after the, the sin of Achan and he gave them that victory at Ai, there was still something there. It was still... They felt that that fellowship was still broken. So that's why that was offered. Those fellowship offerings were 
made. Now, the next thing we're told is that when he wrote the law in stones, that was, was, is that he wrote the law in stones, which was also in obedience to the command of Moses there in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Now, at that time, and in that place, it was customary for kings to celebrate their accomplishments by recording their military exploits on large stones covered with plaster. But here's the thing. With Israel, it was totally different. Notice again that those kings, those pagan kings, all those surrounding kings, celebrated their accomplishments by recording their military exploits. See, what, what sets Israel apart from everyone else wasn't their leader or their army. It was their obedience to God. Their obedience to God's law. Let me also emphasize this important point. As Joshua was writing or copying the words of Moses, the law of Moses, Joshua didn't revise or redact a single word from the law of God. He copied it word for word. He copied word for word what Moses had already recorded on the stones. And that's how, again, we have Scripture. The Old Testament Scriptures, it was just always copied meticulously, word for word. Never, people would mess up, they just chuck the, th the stone and, or whatever, write, whatever they were writing on, and just start over from the beginning. They wouldn't scratch out lines, they just would start all over again. That's how seriously they took it. That should give you another reason to believe the authenticity of the scriptures. Again, he copied it. He didn't, I mean, he, re, he didn't revise or redact any of it. But as great as that was, the truth is this. The law written on stone was external, not internal. And it was useful, yes, it was useful for teaching the people and reminding the people. But the reality is, it can never change people. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 and Corinthians chapter 3 says that believers today, if you're a believer today, you have the written, you have the word of God written in your heart by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul makes it clear in the epistle to the Galatians that while the law can convict sinners and bring them to the cross, bring them to Jesus, the law in and of itself can never convert sinners and make them like Christ. Can't do that. Only the Spirit of God can do that. So, as believers, it's so important to be people of the Word. We have to adhere to God's Word written in the canon of Scripture. Being led by philosophical reasoning, political personalities, social correctness, or even emotional leanings is sin. If you want God's blessings, you, miss, you must live God's way as revealed 
in his word. In the book. We must be true worshipers who live in obedience because the day will come. This isn't a lie. The day will come when sin will be no more. Where sin and death will finally be vanquished. Those who live according to God's word will have no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, and more importantly, no more curse. Through the crucified, risen, and living Christ, we've been forgiven and redeemed. If you're a believer, a born-again believer, you've been forgiven and you've been redeemed, my brothers and sisters. And since we're now also justified, purified, cleansed, made righteous, one day soon we will worship God eternally in His kingdom. Does that sound wonderful? I know, I'm so looking forward to that day. And I hope you are as well. We're told in verse 33 that the people were surrounding the ark on both sides, opposite the Levitical priest carrying it, and divided into two groups. Half of them were on Mount Ebal, and the other half in front of Mount Gerizim. Now, a bit ago, I mentioned the significance of Mount Ebal. But here in verse 33, another mount is mentioned, Mount Gerizim. Now, both these mountains are located in the geographic center of the land. And from either peak, much of the promised land can be seen. I say this because this site not only represents all of the land, but it also became a place that proclaimed the blessings and curses when Israel entered the land. Again, blessings and cursings. One mount represented the curses. One mount represented the blessings. I'll touch more on that again in just a bit. Well, this is now the fourth public monument of stones that has been erected. The first was at Gilgal Gilgal there in Joshua chapter 4, commemorating Israel's passage across the Jordan. The second was in the Valley of Achor, a monument to ancient sin and God's judgment, chapter 7. The third was the entrance to Ai, a reminder of God's faithfulness to help his people. I covered that last week in chapter 8. And so now this fourth monument of stone at Mount Ebal reminded Israel that their success lay, it lay only in their obedience to God's law. And so now the entire nation of Israel had witnessed Joshua write out the law verbatim. And now it's time to read it out loud. So let's look look at those last two verses of chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8, verse 34. Afterward, Joshua read aloud all the words of the law, the blessings as as well as the curses, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read before the entire assembly of Israel, including the women, the dependents, and the resident aliens who lived among them. Now, 
It doesn't get really specific here. It doesn't say it here, but if you want the specifics of uh, what they were to do, the assigned location of each tribe in front of those two mounts, all you have to go, all you have to do is go to Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 11 through 13. And here's what it pretty much says. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali were at Mount Ebal, the Mount of Cursing. And Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, meaning Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh and Benjamin, were at Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. The tribes at Mount Gerizim were founded by men who had either who had either Leah or Rachel for their mother, while the tribes at Mount Ebal were descended from either Zilph, Zilpah, sorry, or uh, Bel Belaha handmaids of Leah and Rachel. I'm really bad with names. I'll admit to that. But uh, anyways, I'm sure if you read the story, you know what, who I'm speaking of here. The only exceptions were Reuben and Zebulun, who belonged to Leah. Reuben had fortified his, stat his, fortified his status as firstborn because he had sinned against his father. Now, in the valley between those two mountains stood the priest and the Levites with the ark, which again, the ark represented the Lord's presence. And they were surrounded by the elders, officers, and judges of, this, of the nation. So this was just a huge, massive scene. One side, on one side of the mountain was one group, the other side of a different mountain was another group, and right in the middle was just everyone else. The people were all facing the ark, which, as I just said, represented the presence of the Lord among his people. When Joshua and the Levites read the blessings of the Lord one by one, and again, this is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The tribes at Mount Gerizim responded with a loud, united amen. And I didn't know if, maybe some of you didn't know this, but amen in the Hebrew, it means so be it. So be it. So whenever you say amen, or scripture is read and someone says amen, or you say amen, I don't have a problem as long as you're not screaming it at me. Um, uh, that's what it means in Hebrew. So be it. And when they read the curses, the tribes at Mount Ebal would respond with their amen after each curse was read. Back in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, God had given the law through Moses at Mount Sinai, and the people accepted it. And when they accepted it, they promised, they promised to obey. Moses then repeated and explained the law on the plains of Moab at the border of Canaan. He then applied it to their lives in the promised land, and admonish them to obey it. This is what he told the people in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 and 28. Now listen carefully, church. Look, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. There will be a blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God I am giving you today, and a curse if you do not, do not obey the commands of the Lord your God, and you turn aside from the path I command you today by following other gods you have yet, you have not known. These are the words of Moses there in Deuteronomy. And so now, 
Now what we see here is Joshua reaffirming, reestablishing, renewing, recommitting the law in the land of promise. Since the area between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim was a natural amphitheater. I'm sure you know what it, if you don't know what an amphitheater is, it's just an open arena. You know, it's kind of like it's here, the stage is here, and it just opens up. Well, it's, it was kind of like a natural amphitheater. Everybody that was there, even probably those that were hard of hearing, could hear the words of the law clearly and respond with intelligence. They, what I mean by that is they wouldn't be like, what, what did he say? I didn't understand. I didn't hear what he said. He mumbled. He sounded like he mumbled. No, he was clear. And they knew exactly what he was saying. Every time, again, they shouted, Amen. By shouting, Amen, to the statements that were read, the people admitted. They were admitting that they understood the law with its blessings and curses. And there again, they were recommitting, they were renewing that vow of the responsibility of knowing it, of hearing it, and obeying it. This included the women, the dependents, and yes, even the resident aliens who, loved, who lived among them. The people were all united in accepting that, yes, this is God's word. They were all in agreement. If everybody, if the women dependents and the resident aliens wanted to share in Israel's conquest, that they wanted to be part of it, they had to submit to the law of Israel's God. Folks, can you imagine, can you put yourself in that place? Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there, to see with your own eyes, to hear with your own ears God's word being read like that by Joshua? That scene... That scene, oh my goodness, it just must have, must have been an amazing, wonderful sight to see and hear. But it reminds us, it ought to remind us that God's word is powerful. God's word is powerful and it's as relevant today as it was then. It's just as powerful and it's just as relevant today as it was when it was written back then. God's word is God's word. It's true. It's holy. It changes people from the inside. Guess what? Jesus is a manifestation. He is the Word. Jesus is the truth. He is the Word. A mountaintop scene much later in Israel's history, history offers a good vantage point from where to view this theme. There, a later Joshua named Jesus, he's standing at the top of this mountain. Peter, with his three, three key disciples, Peter, James, and John. 
Suddenly something strange happens before their eyes. Jesus is transfigured. Now that word in the Greek means to be changed in appearance. His whole appearance just changed. And we're given some descriptions, an idea. I'm sure it was only partial description. I think only words could even explain what that looked like, fully explain what that looked like. But Matthew 17 tells us that his face shone like the sun, like the sun. And Mark chapter 9, verse 3, after he had risen, the grave says his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. And then what happens, if you know the story, what happens after that? Immediately, Moses and Elijah, representatives of the Old Testament law and prophets, they join the scene. They're standing there with the transfigured Jesus. And they're just chatting it up. They're talking. Three discuss Jesus' imminent departure to fulfill his mission in Jerusalem, which was a reference to his coming death, resurrection, and ascension. Then you, you have the excited, outspoken Peter. And he proposes the erection of three temporary shel shelters, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But a bright cloud suddenly envelops them. And God speaks from that cloud. He says this in Mark chapter 9, verse 7, This is my beloved Son, Listen to him. God said this in the cloud as, again, as everyone thought that Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were there. Jesus says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The next instant, the disciples looked, and there was only one person that was present there. Who was it, church? It was Jesus. Jesus was the only one standing there. In short, God had sent a new Moses for us to listen to and demands that we do so. What the instruction of Moses was to Israel, the instruction of Jesus, the new Moses, is to us. Listen again carefully, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, He is the only and perfect mediator of God's Word. As I said just a bit ago, He is the Word. The one to listen, the one uh, to listen to now as someone to whom Moses, Elijah, and Joshua are subordinate. He, Jesus, is the one to listen to now as someone to whom those three, Moses, Elijah, and Joshua, are subordinate. He's here and they're here. He's the one we ought to listen to. There's a lot of Christians who, and I, I get it, I understand that, that they're quick to jump on the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, the Old Testament prophets. For them, that's, that's number one, that's key, that's, that's all they focus on. But they forget that all those, although they're important, and yes, they were servants of God, and they played key roles, they were 
indeed used by God at a specific time and purpose, that, when that purpose ended, that was it. When Jesus came, they were all subordinate to him. All those prophets, all those men, those mighty men of, of God, those Israel's fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all those became lesser. And Jesus became the greater. And yes, you must listen and obey and, and hear what the prophets and the Old Testament fathers have to say. Again, all of it is still God's word. I'm not diminishing it. I'm not saying it's less important. But we must understand that when Jesus came and he spoke, he clarified everything. He made everything clear and plain. Now, if there's still some confusion, ask yourself if it's out of stubbornness or if it's really just the Lord isn't ready yet to reveal that truth to you yet. But Jesus, again, has revealed everything. Everything is, like he clarifies everything in the, in the Old Testament. You may not understand everything right away. But you have a lifetime. You don't have to understand it all right now, this, mom this moment, within a month. As long as you have breath in your lungs, as long as your heart is still beating, he's gonna, Lord is gonna, God is going to reveal new tru the truths. New what I mean by new truths is, is Jesus' words will come and you'll be like, it's like the light bulb turns on. Oh, that's what that means. That's what he was trying to say. That's how it, that's how the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, what Jesus was doing, what Jesus was saying. Friends, church, Christians, don't make the mistake again of, of just making those men, the words they say, more important than the words of Jesus. Again, he is the only and perfect mediator of God's word. More important, unlike the prophets who were human, this is God's son. This is God's beloved son. He wears human flesh just like they did. But only he is God living right here among humans. Can let me emphasize, he is the word incarnate. Consider for a moment, if you think about it, think about uh, how wonderful and crazy the term son implies. When Joshua read the instruction from Mount Ebal, Israel listened seriously to it as God's word because of Joshua's status as servant. But the axis as a son, but the axis a son has to a father far surpasses that of a servant. On Mount Sinai, Moses spent more, ta more time talking directly with God than any human in history. It's true, look it up. He spent more time talking directly with God than anybody else in history. But God's own son, God's own son, he knows the Father like no other. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The words I speak come from the Father. Paraphrasing. You hear Him. You see Him. 
you're seeing a representation of God the Father. That's who his personality, his love, the way he just cared for people, his mercy. That's exactly who God is. I tell people all the time, if you want to know God, if you really want to know God in a personal way, read the words of Jesus. See how he interacted with people. See how he interacted with his family. See how he interacted with sinners. See how he interacted with the religious folk. Hear him, listen to him. And you can see that he has a totally different way of vibing with him, with talking to them, interacting, being around them. Shows us the Father. And you think about the sinners out there in the world. <coughs> sinners at your job, your school, those who live complete, a complete crazy lifestyle that is against God his word that you believe is immoral the Bible tells us that it's wrong and it's sinful read God's word and see how Jesus interacted with sinners around him how did he interact with that guy that was possessed by a multitude of demons how did he interact with the blind, with the deaf, those that were considered outcasts of society that no one wanted to touch, no one wanted to deal with. How did he deal with those that were in sexual sin? Did he say, ew, get away from me. Ew, you filthy sinner. No. He had compassion on them. He loved them. How did he deal with those that were super religious and were just stuck and stubborn and stuck on their ways? He showed them a better way. He couldn't control what they said or how they reacted to what he said, but when you hear him, when you read his word, that's how Jesus is. And, and it should tell you that loves everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He loves. That's why he came here on earth. He came here to die for you, a filthy sinner. So if he came here to die for your filthy sin, do you think he came here to die for that person's homosexual lifestyle, for that transgender, for that woman that's in adultery, for that Catholic priest who's just stuck in his Catholic ways, for that or Jeff Bezos, or Elon Musk, or even those prisoners that are in solitary confinement on death row. Yes, he died for all of them. Not just for you. He died for you, yes, but not just for you. He died for everyone. God's own son knows the father like no one else. A popular story reports the bedtime scene in a child's bedroom. Susie has prayed her usual prayer. You know that one, now I lay me down to sleep. And her mother is tucking her in for the night. 
though solemn and sincere, the prayer has not allayed Susie's deathly fear of the dark. She pleads with her mother to stay with her until she falls asleep. But her mother kisses Susie goodnight, turns off the light, and pauses at a door for a final word. Listen to what the mom says. She says, there's no reason to be afraid, Susie. She says, remember, God is right here with you. Susie ponders that thought for a moment. And then from the dark, she says, but I want somebody with skin. My friends, Jesus is God with, sin, with skin. I'm sorry, with skin. With skin speaking to us. It's an obvious point, but one worth making. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. If God, the God of the universe, the God, the creator of the universe, the, the creator of everything, has said, this is my son, listen to him, shouldn't mankind listen to him? We have free will. We can choose not to. Humanity has free will. They can choose not to. There's a lot of voices out there that they want our attention. They want your attention. People on the street ask to explain their legislative petitions in order to get your signatures. You know those ones that are asking for signatures or all that, or even surveys. Clever, clever, carefully crafted media commercials entice us to buy a certain brand. Everything from an iPhone to a Tesla to a house. everything entice us out there to to buy certain things meetings at work discuss all kinds of important matters as do the many phone calls one makes and receives daily I was gonna say something about phone calls but I won't go there it's hard for me to make phone calls really it is it's difficult um, and receive phone calls. But the world, it seems, it just seems that it, it echoes an in incessant blah, 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 blah. You know that adult voice on Charlie Brown? <laughs> it seems like that's the entire world. They want your attention. They want you... They want you to listen. They want to distract you. But we mustn't let the surrounding noises, all those surrounding voices, drown out Jesus' voice in our ears. We must hear him. Hear him. I'll say it again. Hear him, church. I urge you, I recommend, I, as your pastor here, to meditate carefully on Scripture, to hear the quiet sounds of His voice. You may not hear a loud, audible voice, but if you read those letters, those red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Revelation, He's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you. Not in the way that you want it, but in the way that is right for you 
at that moment. Spend time in quiet prayer, listening to the gentle whisper of his voice. Let's keep ever before us the question, what is Jesus saying to me? Above all, church, my brothers and sisters in Christ, a fellow believer, hear him. I conclude in our passage, at least five separate activities were involved here. Number one, Joshua built an altar. Number two, the people offered burnt offerings. Number three, the people sacrificed fellowship offerings. Number four, Joshua wrote the words of the law on stones. And five, Joshua read the words of the law in public before all the people. The nation was now ready to continue moving forward. Now from this point on the history of the Jews depended on their attitude toward the law which had been read in the hearing of their day and which they responded to with an amen. Agreed. They agreed. And when they were obedient, as it said in Deuteronomy, there was blessing. When they were disobedient, there was judgment. The tragic, it is tragic that the affirmations of this momentous hour faded so quickly. And I covered the book of Judges a couple years ago, maybe a couple years ago, and I talked about how after Joshua, man, things started going downhill quick. But these judges, but again, they stopped taking the law, the word of God seriously. And as a result, there was judgment. But when that time, those times that they did obey, there was blessing. So let me ask you now, today, at this very moment, what's going on with you? What is happening in your life right now? Where does God sit in your life? Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus everything or is he nothing? I want to invite you, if you have spent your life trying to find God, trying to know God, and you've tried different methods, you've tried different things, and you realize that none of of that has worked, none of that has actually brought brought fulfillment, has filled that void in you that can't seem to go away. I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you to the cross to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that he may forgive you of your sins, and restore that relationship that was broken because of sin. When you do that, when you surrender your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will make his home in you. And you will start hearing God. You will start understanding knowing God more. You will start understanding what His Word says. If you, many of you probably have said, oh yeah, I've read the Bible 500 times, a million times, and I still don't get it. I still don't understand it. And, or you have a different interpretation of what the, that's a good one too. You have a different interpretation of what the Bible says. You think it says something, but it doesn't actually say that. 
I remember having a conversation with someone before, and they were trying to explain something in the Bible, and I'm looking at them like, no, that's not what it says. Again, he thought he knew, but he didn't know. Well, when you have the Holy Spirit living in you, things will start to make more sense. Fresh vision. You will be given. Sounded like Yoda there for a minute, but you, you'll be given a fresh vision. Jesus will clarify things for you. But you have to surrender your life. So if you're ready to do that, if you're watching this right now, listening to this message, if you're here today and you're ready to surrender your life to Him, or even if you want to recommit your life to Jesus, you want a renewal, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head wherever you may be. all sincerity, with all your heart. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I now admit and confess I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I now believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent from them all. I turn from those sins and now confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of all my past, present, and future sin. And thank you for saving me. From sin and death. So now I ask you, Jesus, to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me Teach me, show me a new and better way how to love more, how to have mercy, how to have compassion more. In my new born again life, in your name, amen. If you prayed that, if you've Sincerely pray that, or have you, if you've recommitted your life to Jesus, please reach out to us. We want to know your story. We want to be able to help you on your next steps. We want to be able to, to celebrate with you. You're not alone in this new life, in this life as a believer. It's not meant to be lived alone. So now I encourage you, Get a Bible. Find a Bible that is easy to read and understand. Nowadays, I don't recommend for a, a Gen Z or a millennial to get a New Kings or a King James version. I understand because I have kids of my own that you kind of need a, a different version. I mean, there's a lot of great versions out there. We here at the Bible, here at church, at Fresh Vision, Calvary Chapel, use the, um, the CSV. A lot of people use the NLT. A lot of people use the ESV. There's a lot of great Bibles out there, but if you want, to, we want, you want us to help you with that, again, reach out to us. We can help you. But get into, start getting into God's Word um, as soon as you can. Uh, let Him start speaking to you. Listen to Jesus. Thank you again for joining us. I hope that you have a great and wonderful week. Be a blessing to others. And I look forward to seeing you as we continue on the book of Joshua. Have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. 
Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.